Order members, it is now time for questions to the Minister of Culture, Arts and Leisure, and we will start with listed questions. I call Mr Nelson McCausland. Question number one. I thank the member for his question. It has been alleged that I and department officials were aware of suggested need to purchase and demolish houses adjacent to Casement Park as far back as the summer of 2012. This is utterly untrue and unworthy of belief. As a design team for the project was not formally appointed until the 3rd of September 2012, there would not have been any design information, even preliminary sketches, available for discussion prior to their appointment. I understand that designs were first considered by the STG on the 11th of February 2013. As previously stated, I was unaware of allegations in relation to concerns around emergency exit in the Casement Park prior to Paul Scott's appearance at the Committee for Culture, Arts and Leisure on the 30th of April 2015. Indeed I, indeed, I made this point very clear in my evidence at a subsequent CAL Committee appearance on the 21st of May 2015, and I still stand by this statement. I call Nelson McCousin for supplementary. Um, I think, uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answer, but I, I would have to say with respect that it is not uh, a full answer, and it is a matter that will be returned to. But would she acknowledge that uh, she should have been aware of the serious issues around emergency exiting at the point where the then uh, Chief Executive of Sport in Northern Ireland, after one year in post, had an article, a full page article, in an interview in the Belfast Telegraph in which she referred specifically to serious issues about emergency exiting. Was the Minister not aware of those concerns at that early stage? Well, first of all, these are all allegations that have been countered by a sequence of reports and indeed independent reports. And I would assume, as a member should assume, and indeed all the members of this House should assume, given anyone's position on it, and I mean, they've, ref they've referred this article on at least two other occasions, anyone's position in relation to uh, working with the department, particularly around these alleged safety concerns really should have brought to my attention, and they didn't. And the first time I was made aware of this, and I repeat it again, was when Mr Scott appeared in front of the committee on the 30th of April last year. I call Sean Lynch. Sure, I'm a good uh, last count caller. I'm going great this election here at Dunfragerson. Minister, <laughs> did the Sports NA, either chair, board members or any staff at any stage, raise any concerns with you regarding emergency exits in at Casement, Gurramaya? Uh, I thank the member for a supplementary question. The answer is no. Sport and I, uh, either the previous board, current board, previous chief executive, current chief executive, previous chair, current chair, no one on board and I did at any stage make me aware of any concerns that they had around emergency exit in the Casement Park. Sport and I, for the members and other members' and, uh, information, also sit on the stadium the program sponsor board, which I chair, which is the place for those issues if they have concerns to be raised, and they never raised any issues of this nature around emergency evacuation. As I said, and I repeat again, the first I was made aware of any such allegations or concerns was when they were raised by Mr Scott at the CAL Committee in April 2015. Question two has been withdrawn. I call Oliver McMullen. Right. Number three, question three. I thank the member for his question. I can advise him that in the last three years, up until March 2016 to this year, Sport and I have awarded almost £50,000 of funding to the NI Archery Society from its athlete investment programme towards costs in implementing a training and, and competition programme for targeted athletes. In addition to this, and in the same term, Sport and I invested £75,000 to the Society from its own performance focus programme. The investment relates in particular to talent identification and indeed development. I am content that this support helped to provide opportunities for athletes from right across the north to achieve considerable success at various international and national archery competitions during the past year. It is remarkable that four individuals won a total of 14 medals and two teams won a gold and silver medal respectively. I would like to take this opportunity to congr congratulate each and every one of them on this fantastic achievement. 
call over on for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for her answers to date? Can the Minister tell us that, that, that uh, what is the Minister's department doing uh, to help all athletes in general who wish to compete in the 216 Olympics in Rio? Well, I thank the member for supplementary question. It is quite important um, that certainly all members are aware that Sport and I is doing everything I can to support, uh, provide support to athletes from other sports who are intending to compete in the 2016 Olympic and Paralympic Games. A performance focus, which also supports the employment of expertise in sports and development in the high performance systems, which has been very beneficial for athletes and indeed their governing bodies in the past. As well as this, the Athlete Investment Programme, which does provide assistance towards costs incurred by athletes to undertake the required training and competition programmes and in support of elements of the athletes' living costs, which I know the member has raised previously. And they also provide a provision of planning, sports and science, and sports medicine services, which have been serviced by the Sports Institute. I call Nelson McCausland. Thank you. Um, the Minister referred to support for the NI Archery Society, which I assume refers to the Northern Ireland Archery Society. Uh, I welcome the support for a Northern Ireland uh, focused organisation, which should also therefore be supportive of the Northern Ireland Boxing Association in their efforts to secure recognition and support from Sport NI. I'm absolutely not supportive of uh, a separate boxing association, the member will know. Uh, and, in, and in fact, I feel not only that the chair of the CAL committee and indeed his colleagues and others have actually ended up putting some of the athletes under terrible pressure in a year where they're going to be competing in the Rio Olympics, and I think that's quite disgraceful. Patsy McLean is not in this place. Uh, I call Peter Weir. Question number five. I thank the member for his question. In March 2011, the executive endorsed an investment of £36 million for sub-region stadium development for football as a priority in the next comprehensive spend review period. The sub-region stadium programme for soccer has a 12-week consultation, which commenced on 30 November and will run until 22 of this month. Once the stakeholder consultation exercise is complete and the programme has been finalised, I expect it to be open for applications. This will be later in 2016, and my officials will be, will be available to offer advice and support to potential applicants throughout this process. Given our growing reputation and our ability to attract large-scale events, both for sports and entertainment, there is a need for a provision of international standard facilities capable of hosting major events, the, the provision of sub-regional training facilities suitable for hosting such major events such as Rugby World Cup is also essential. It is my intention to submit a bid for funding for a second phase of the sub-regional programme to meet the needs of soccer, Gaelic and rugby in the next comprehensive spent review. I call Peter Weir for something. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her response so far. Can I ask the Minister to make reference that her, whatever emerges, that her officials will be available for advice and support to football clubs? Um, obviously, it's likely that whatever final announcement will have some element or cocktail of, of matched funding being required. Can the Minister give a particular assurance that there will be uh, assistance to the, school, uh, to the clubs from our officials in helping to find that match funding? Well, certainly it isn't my officials' jobs to find match funding, but certainly it is, it is their jobs to try and give them assistance in terms of information. I know even through discussions that I've had personally with some of the local government and the councils, um, and indeed with some of the clubs, um, this is a difficulty for them. Uh, some of the clubs are actually looking at what they can do, to, certainly in terms of geographical basis, to try and make sure that there's facility, particularly in an area. But as I said, this is still open for consultation. It is important that once clubs have established that they can apply and that they meet all the criteria, that certainly is our official job to try and signpost them to uh, information regarding other potential sources of funding, but certainly not to make applications for them. I call Ian Milne. Uh, can I ask the Minister, is Derry City uh, FC eligible to apply for funding? Uh, and can the Minister give an update on the Dizzy Field project? Thank you. Well, in short, yes, they are eligible to apply for funding, and I would anticipate that that is the case. I also can confirm that the commitment that I have made about securing funding of £2 million to invest in the Dizzy Field playing fields, which is part of the project, and taken forward. 
by Derry City and Strabane Council to redevelop the Brandy Wells Sports Centre and indeed the adjacent Daisy Fields playing fields. Um, so the, the assistance from my department will cover some of the costs for free furbishing of a full size pitch. But certainly my officials, Sport and I and indeed the Council have been working very, very closely together. And I understand that the Council is considering its options for the location of the facility and will be subject to Council approval and indeed full planning permission. I call Leslie Cree. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her reply so far. Minister, just for clarification, the cost of this project for the stadium appears to be $9.75 million. Is this figure ring-fenced, and what proportion of that project cost is available for the sub-regional football stadium programme? Well, there's £36 million pounds for the sub-regional uh, programme, and uh, as I said to, in response to Mr Weir, that already clubs are in discussions not only with each other but indeed other potential sources of funding um, about trying to ensure that they get every opportunity. But already I know that there isn't enough money in this to meet all the needs out there. Uh, I don't think there's ever enough money in anyone's department to meet all the needs, but certainly in relation to this, and that's why I would anticipate a third level of sub-regional funding to try and ensure that particularly groups and grassroots groups get better access to better facilities because, to be honest, a lot of the clubs here run on a very voluntary basis, don't have the professional wherewithal, but actually providing vital services, vital support that actually keep young people fit and healthy and safe. So I would anticipate that clubs like that need to get additional support and I'm currently looking at options, but certainly those options won't be real until this consultation closed about what, all, what other support that we can give to those clubs. I call Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her uh, answers. Can the Minister give the Assembly a cast iron guarantee that whatever the money is come to be divided out, that there will be, it will be done fairly and squarely, and that there will be no preference to either uh, of the two major parties, that's Sinn Féin and DUP, in uh, selected uh, teams or grounds or whatever you like to call it? Well, certainly, I think. Um, what the member is really suggesting is that both ourselves and DUP would box clubs off. That's basically what he's suggesting. And, and I'd like to use this opportunity to completely refute that. Um, it's public money, as the member will know, and it needs to be scrutinised, including the decisions about how that money is spent should be scrutinised. And I would anticipate that the process will be completely open, completely transparent. And indeed, will certainly be scrutinised. So hopefully, that gives some assurance to the member's question. I call Anna Lou. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number six, please. I thank the member for her question. Wish her a happy New Year. Um, as a member will know, and I have said this repeatedly, but it's worth repeating. In response, the Tory administration has once again imposed uh, massive cuts on on our black grant and indeed on our community. And my job is to try and allocate and work against the, the, the worst impacts uh, in terms of the service provision. I am also content that both my department and its ALBs are taking every step to minimise the impacts of frontline services, particularly in the community and voluntary sector, including those provided by the community and voluntary sector, which actually do a massive amount of work. Uh, and by extracting as much savings as I can, and indeed the ALB can, from administration overhead costs. As a member will appreciate, this work is ongoing, and I hope to bring it to a conclusion once I have settled on budgets by the end of this month. I am, of course, keenly aware of the work carried out by the community and voluntary sector, uh, and, but it is, it, it is on. Um, it, it's, it's not enough for me just to give those assurances. I'd certainly have to justify when I settle on the budget at the end of the month, but I want to give the member assurance as much as possible that I will look at every opportunity to try and reduce costs so maximum spend happens within the community and voluntary sector. I call Anna Lowe for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. First of all, may, may I uh, wish you and members of the House a happy Chinese New Year today. Hear, hear. Hear, Thank hear. You. What's that all about? <laughs> <laughs> Time would not allow me to expand oh, on that. <laughs> yes, um, I want to thank the minister for her uh, response, 
and I know she really cares about funding for the community and voluntary sector, so I need to thank her very positive uh, comment. But can I ask the Minister, what steps has she taken to ensure when DECAO goes into the big new department, uh, the Department for the Communities, that priorities for culture, arts and leisure will be, will be high up on the agenda of the new structure? Well, the member will also be aware that the consultation into the overarching arts and cultural strategy for 10 years will close, certainly, this week. And it's crucial that when I left the department, when I leave the department, I leave it, that there is, for the first time ever, an overarching strategy where departments will have their role to play in the delivery, investment and, I suppose, the funding for arts and culture going into the next 10 years. I believe that's critical because that's been something that's been missing. Uh, and frankly, I could never understand why there was never an overarching strategy for arts and culture in the same way there is for sports. I call Patsy McLaurin. <coughs> Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And my apologies for earlier. Um, things seem to have proceeded a lot faster than, than what they had, and I missed my question, so my apologies for that. But could I ask yes, the Minister, in light of the important input of the community and voluntary sector, what level of engagement has there been between herself and indeed senior representatives of her department around that particular sector with a view to identifying either sources of funding within the department or indeed to help them and facilitate them identify alternative sources of funding elsewhere. Well, I thank the member for his question and, and um, if, he, if he wishes, I'll try and get his previous question that he, he missed answer to him in writing, so just to, so we can have that. Uh, certainly in terms of the response I give Diana Lowe, and I'm sure it will come up again, I have been using this consultation period to engage very actively and proactively with members from the arts and cultural sectors right across the board. My officials have been there as well. They will and have done, they will respond to the, the, the consultation, but certainly I'm, at the minute I haven't settled on the budget yet, I intend to at the end of the month. And already we're asking the ALBs where possible to look at how they can make savings in order do we try and get it out to the voluntary community sector. In terms of other sources of funding, the Arts Council have been very proactive in, in trying to not only secure other sources of funding or give information, particularly around council areas, but also within Europe and indeed some of the trusts as well. And I believe NICVA have been very proactive as well, um, as, as well as some of the area partnerships. So I believe as much as that can be done has been done. I call Martin O'Millier. I'm going to ask John Corley, and uh, when I'm uh, here from YCA here, Anna Foster, and I wish to express yes. Happy New Year to Anna as well. Anna, you're too diplomatic, uh, Deputy, Chair, uh, Deputy Speaker, too diplomatic to mention it's the Year of the Monkey, where the media can insert their, their own joke. But I want to ask uh, the Minister, um, I suppose one of the great difficulties of the fresh start was we didn't get the budget we wanted from London, and I wonder what uh, particular steps she has taken to offset the impact of those to Tory cuts. And I think a particular Minister tomorrow outburst Queer Arts Festival launches, and that's a, a newer festival in the city, a great arts event looking for funding. I wonder just what steps can be taken generally to offset the impact of these Tory cuts. Well, certainly, um, I thank the member for a supplementary question, and I'm sure some of what I have answered, certainly Diana Lowe and to Patsy, may have partly went some way of answering his question, but it is worth repeating that certainly subsequent uh, budgets and cer certainly subsequent statements uh, and, same and budget settlements that we have received uh, ongoing cuts from our Black Grant by the Tory government, and that's going to have an impact certainly in terms of delivery. And it is quite shocking that given the level of need and support and development and inspiration and aspiration that the culture and arts sector have provided, they do help regenerate the economy, they do keep people well and safe, safe and healthy. And I think it's really important that we use even the last days of this consultation to make those arguments for additional money in the arts. Because it is and has proven to be that it's money not only well spent, but it also can help regenerate money. I met with Out Outburst Festival. I wish them all the best, but there is an example of when you put a small investment in, there will be a big return for the whole city, a host town. I call Basil McRae. Uh, Minister, many of the ALBs are working on a budget cut of 5.7%. Do you envisage changing that so that, for example, libraries NI might get a lower uh, reduction 
whereas the Arts Council might get a bigger reduction. Sir, Maggie Basil, I'm not dodging your question. I'm sure you'll know in the past I've never dodged your questions or anyone else's for that matter, but I'm still actively considering those budgets, and it is completely inappropriate <coughs> for me to indicate which uh, settlement for which LB at this stage, particularly since I'm still getting the information in. So certainly I'll happily keep the member, and not only members of the CAL committee, but members of this House, posted when those decisions have been made. Moving on, I call Sandra Overend. Hey, thank you. Question seven, please. I thank the member for her question. The source for the figures is the Department of Education School Census figures for 2010-11 to 2014-15. This shows a remarkable 24% growth in the numbers in Irish medium education in just five years, and a similar trend applies in relation to adult education in Irish. The 2013 Economic and Social Research Institute survey is the most comprehensive and authoritative source of information about Irish in the 21st century. Their survey indicates strong and increasing support for the Irish language, both north and south, and an, an expectation that government should do more to promote the language. My own department's initiative, LIFA, to promote Irish has been exceptionally successful, with over 17,000 people already signed up. This increase in demand for Irish and increase in public expectations that the Irish language will be properly promoted and developed by government form an important backdrop to my decision to take forward within the framework of the Irish Language Academy. Thank, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for that. But are the, the figures that the Minister refers to are quoted percentages, um, which are relative. Uh, so what were the actual figures uh, for the Irish Language Academy? Sorry, I didn't hear the member's last uh, point. The actual figures? Yeah, well, certainly I, I'll get the actual figures for the member. I'll get each of the percentages that I quoted. I'll, I'll get the, the actual figures. If I can see the member turn their face up. If there's something in that that she wants to add to, she can do it in writing, and I'll happily respond to her. I call Gregory Campbell. Deputy Speaker, uh, the Minister has outlined the um, genesis of the, uh, and the source of the uh, Irish language percentages and numbers. Does she uh, agree with me that pursuit of any language can often be thwarted and stunted whenever people see politicisation of that Irish language, such as her colleagues in Sinn Féin have done on numerous occasions in this chamber and outside? Well, certainly I think the member really does stretch it beyond belief. The only person, or the only people I have ever heard politicising a language, stretching a language, causing offence to people who use that language, is not only yourself but also your party colleagues and some others. So if I thought for one minute that the member was genuine in trying to find out what can we do as a community, what can we do as a community to work with people who have Irish as their first language or who want to have Irish as their first language, what can we do as a community not to cause assault and offence to children who are learning and who are educated through the medium of Irish language? And what can we do as a community to try and get over the petty, bigoted sectarianism that they have constantly perpetuated Order. in this House around a language that belongs to everyone. Yeah, if the member has any of those Order. questions, I would like to hear. Order. I would Order. like to hear what they Order. are. Order. 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 The member shall be named. I would ask the minister to continue with her answer if she has further to say. Thank you. I think I have answered the question. I call Alex Maskey. Could I uh, first of all thank the Minister for her responses uh, so far and could I uh, ask the Minister, the Minister obviously be very aware has our department has been a contributor that and recently in my own constituency that there's been the biggest investment in the common clue in Arden maybe fifty years, which is a cradle of Irish language learning for, for many decades, many people. Could the Minister actually congratulate those Irish language learners in my own constituency and perhaps give others examples of others? Well, certainly I would uh, congratulate Common Clue and Art, who, um, as a girl growing up in North Belfast, were certainly 
seen as one of the authorities in learning and developing a language, particularly in given the decades where it wasn't easy. But thankfully, there are many others who not only had the experience of coming to an art in Belfast, but they're now growing right across the north and indeed right across the island. Force Nagilga, in their survey they produced last year, actually showed that a lot of people have now taken up and formally learning the Irish language, and they're learning in places like Clue and Art. And I was absolutely delighted to make an investment in that. Members are also lucky enough to have Cahir in the Gael Takta in his own consistency, the Gael Talk Quarter, which in itself, um, through Fobridge First Year, I have made an investment in them. So they are the Secretariat of Cahir in the Gael Takta, the Gael Talk Quarter, and they will be taking forward a scope and exercise around an Irish language academy. I call Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her answer so far. Uh, can the Minister outline to this House when we can expect to hear the outcome of the assessment to determine levels of economic, social development, and employment opportunities in relation to the Irish language, and if these levels could be developed within the framework of the Irish Language Academy? Well, certainly the first scoping study that we have done around some of the topics that the member has raised actually highlighted the need for a purpose-built standalone academy, not just for the Irish language, but also one looking at some of the same things in Ulster Scots culture and heritage. <coughs> However, it was very academic, academically focused, which actually missed the point that the member has raised. So taking some of the parts that were raised in the first scope and exercise, but actually doing a fresh one to look at not only economic regeneration and development, job creation, but also learning the language and how that can be you know, blended in. And one of the big gaps that wasn't included in the first was for children and young people particularly who are leaving post-primary and maybe not going to third level, what can we do for that very growing gap? Uh, and also for adults, for people who are learning the language, to make sure that wherever they go, should it be a class in Straban, class in Cleonard, class anywhere else, that they get the same standard and get the same level across the board. So I'm also looking forward to the results of that scope and study, because at the end of the day, the Irish language is regenerating the economy. Irish language activists are ratepayers and taxpayers too. They have rights, and I want to ensure that we collectively not only protect those rights, but do it so with an open heart. Moving on, I call Claire Hanna. Your speaker, question eight. Thank the member for her question. I believe it is of significant importance for my department and its arms length bodies to raise their profile in Europe and expand European engagement, including maximising potential funding sources. DECAL through the Arts Council has a dedicated resource in place to help artistic, cultural and creative organisations access competitive European funding, mainly through the Creative Europe funding programme. During the previous funding round, the Arts Council facilitated a drawdown of an average of £300,000 per year to organisations in the arts and cultural sectors. Since Creative Europe was established in 2014, a number of events have been delivered by a dedicated European engagement officer to both the audiovisual and creative and cultural sectors across the north, with more than 1,000 participants attending. And in addition, and since that time, a comprehensive support has been provided to 15 projects submitted to the Creative Europe programme. To date, both the Arts Council and Forest Nagilga have secured funding from Creative the Creative Europe funding stream. I call Claire Hanna for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers. And I agree that the EU has been um, an important catalyst, not just in funding terms, but in the increased audience for our art and obviously the less tangible benefits around diversity. Um, have your department done any planning um, for how that deficit, that funding deficit, would be met in the unfortunate event of a UK withdrawal from the EU? Well, certainly, um, as a member has pointed out, Certainly there is um, a lot of concern, a lot of anxiety around the whole Braddock's argument. My department, along with other departments, are actually looking at what the implication how, what will be for that. Um, but certainly, I think even the sectors and indeed the community, I mean, I heard myself even some of the debates from the business community, both in England and in here, 80% there, 90% for staying as it is, not, not withdrawn. And I think if you were to apply that same question, particularly across culture, arts and leisure and indeed community and voluntary sector, I imagine it will be in similar figures, but certainly we're still trying to walk through potential scenarios on how whatever gaps are created can be met, if at all. And that is the end of our period time for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Robin Swan. 
much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In a written answer to the Minister, she recently told me she had paid over £300,000 to a licensee of salmon nets. Can she give us an update as to what steps her department are taking to either buy out or close down the other salmon nets that are still there? Well, certainly, as a member will appreciate, this has been an elongated process, uh, and particularly the, for the, the families, this has been a, a, a business that has been in families for generations. Uh, we want to try and be as far as possible uh, within the guidelines of uh, certainly public spent and public money. Um, but I have not any definitive response in terms of what's left uh, with or, or what to do with the, with the remainder of the salmon, the net owners, so I certainly respond to the member in writing, but I will give him as robust as an answer as I possibly can, because I'm aware that he's working with some of them in his constituency. Call Robin Swan for supplementary. I thank the Minister for, for her open answer. Um, she's well aware of the work that was done on salmon fisheries, especially in regard to catch and release. If that amount of money has been attributed to the, the net owners and there's still more money to outstand there to pay them, can she advise if she's any sort of counterbalance to give to angling clubs? who voluntarily went into catch and release at the start to really drive the, the conservation of salmon at that stage? Well, like the member, I actually commend the whole Anglin clubs right across because they have very enthusiastically, very genuinely, not only helped with the catch and release, the mandatory catch and release that it is now, but also have and still continue to act as guardians of the waterways. And I understand there is some concern, given the level of protections that they are engaged in, that some of the Nets men seem to be unwilling to engage in that process. So I do understand the sensitivities within that. But notwithstanding that, I will try and get the member the answers that he has asked for as quickly as I possibly can. But I definitely hear what the member is saying. I call Katrina Rowan. On Fede Lesnara, we flourish game Pobble Gaelga. I wonder would the Minister give me an update on this game Pobble Gaelga programme? Well, I thank the member for her question, uh, and this is something that is and still remains fairly topical within the communities. Scan Pobble Gilga, the new arrangements, which will mean you'll see from 19 groups coming up to 25 to 27, will certainly happen after July of this year. Uh, I am thankful that the work between myself and certainly my counterparts will try and ensure that not only is the scheme has been extended, but there will be a, an increase in some of the running costs. But this is, this is if you're ever looking for an example of what works on the ground, helping people who are learning Irish, but helping families and communities to try and get service through the medium of Irish, then it's again Pobble Gilga. I call Katrina Rowan for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. And I wonder, um, would she outline for us what approach her counterparts, Minister uh, McHugh and Minister Humphreys in the south of Ireland, are taking in relation to Scheme Public Welfare? Well, certainly we um, agreed the, the revision of the scheme, so they're happy with that. Um, and we're still trying to look at what additional money we can get in to. Uh, for Snagilga for this scheme specifically and we're certainly looking at ways in which the groups who apply to the scheme can access other funding within for Snagilga and we're also looking at perhaps an increase in some of the running costs because some of the running costs that have been awarded for, from for Snagilga to the groups potentially will actually inhibit the groups from operating which isn't the original intention so we're having discussions and we're hopefully get this concluded before both of us leave our offices. Uh, but I know the officials in both departments are working very closely in this as we speak. I call Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, in light of some of the problems that have arisen in relation to Casement Park, is she aware of any alternatives being sought by the GAA uh, as an alternative venue other than Casement Park? Well, certainly I'm not aware of any alternative uh, venues, and there shouldn't be. Uh, the member, some of his party, are in the awful position of lobbying for the Rugby 2023 World Cup bid. And you have other members who are anti GAA, anti Caseham Park, anti West Belfast, who don't want the investment getting into this area. So, not only are I completely unaware of any other venue, if it's not Caseham Park, it's not anywhere. I call Peter Weir for supplementary. Good to see a wide range of alternatives being considered, but can I ask, in light of some of the difficulties, what actions are being taken by her department to try and resolve and find a solution between local residents and the GAA? 
Well, there are several residence groups. Uh, I know the members' parties working with the Mora group as they're perfectly entitled to do. Um, I have certainly met with Mora in the past. I have met with other residence groups and indeed other businesses in the community who, whose premises have been uh, on the doorsteps of Caseham Park for generations. Uh, I will ensure that when the pre-consultation period happens in March, that all those people with concerns, the Ulster Council will hear what those concerns are and where appropriate and if they're reasonable concerns they need to be rectified before any formal plan and application is submitted. I call William Humphrey. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, uh, what level of funding has the Minister allocated to the commemoration of the Easter Rebellion? Uh, well, there certainly there was a package of funding that was made available from my department for the decade of centenaries. Um, I'd certainly get the member a figure for the Easter Rising and indeed for the song uh, for this year, because it is 2016 we're talking about. I'd certainly get him a figure, not only of how much is spent, but certainly on what some of the ALBs within my department are doing in terms of exhibitions and talks and discussions. Because uh, I think, given uh, the, the opportunities that we had to go to lectures, go to events, from other commemorations, I would like to uh, ensure that all members from all parties could feel that they could certainly go to, the, for example, the Lynn Hall Library or the Ulster Museum or whatever the case may be, to hear firsthand certain uh, uh, aspects of either the Somme or the Easter Rising, but certainly get the member of those figures in writing. I call William Humphrey for supplementary. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I th thank the Minister for the answer, and I look forward to getting those figures. I'd be interested in them. Given the rebellion's divisive nature, its attack on the state and on democracy, and the fact that it had little or no support across Ireland, and particularly in what is now Northern Ireland, is this the best use of public money? Well, certainly the member has his own perspective of history. Uh, from my own perspective, um, I believe that we entered into uh, supporting myself and then the Daddy Minister, now the member's party leader, and supporting the decade of centenaries, which included it all. Uh, there are certainly aspects of the member's history and the history of his community that I certainly feel is impalatable. I certainly don't feel it's democratic. Um, however, I'm big enough to recognise that we need to celebrate and commemorate these events from a position of respect, a position of dealing with facts, uh, and also a position that we're actually hoping to regenerate and uh, generate some discussion and hopefully build some good relations. So hopefully the member will have that in mind when he asks a question about something like this before, because I can tell you now, some of the feedback that I've had is that certainly the community, right across, not his community, mine, the community, is up for this. I call John Dallet. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Minister did indicate at the beginning of her uh, question time that she's coming to the end of our department's uh, reign. I'm sure the Minister will agree with me that the recent controversy about the sports complex in Dungiven was shameful, should never have happened, and is she satisfied that the money now set aside for that project is ring-fenced and that some future Minister responsible for culture, arts and leisure doesn't unravel it? Well, I'm, I am content that that money has been ring-fenced, and just to make sure um, that I repeat it again, the money is ring fenced for my department for a sports facility. I think it is incredible, and that's what I'll say, as much as I'll say it is incredible, that in 2016 we still have people who would literally cut their nose to spite their face. I think it's ridiculous that with public money that we're still looking at an us and them situation rather than dress and need. And I believe the investment done given will have the people of that town, but also the outlying areas, and I believe the people I met come from right across that community and the members' constituency of East Derry. So if there's any hint or any saying of any funny business or nonsense going to happen, it will certainly not happen with my money. I thank the Minister for a very positive answer. And uh, uh, As someone who spent 33 years, the same time as our Lord spent in this earth in Coleraine, it was heartbreaking to see the performance that went on and really does the minister agree that 18 years into an assembly we should have matured beyond this sniggering at each other's misfortunes 
and the energy and synergy put in to try and deprive a community of its basic needs. Well, I agree, the member, and I, I agree with the member in terms of 18 years, particularly after a Good Friday Agreement, there is an expectation that things should have moved on. And sometimes when you look at issues or events that have happened, it is a real flashback, perhaps even further back than 18 years ago. But for people who want to go back to the past, they're, they're severely deluded. There is no going back. We're all going forward. Some maybe need to be dragged forward, but forward they'll go. And in relation to Dungiven or any other sports facility, it's about need. It's not about creed. And the days in which people invested in facilities and tied swings up are well gone. I call Andy Allen. Minister. Given the timescale of the budget process this year is very tight and will not allow for the usual consultation, has the Minister any plans to seek comments from key stakeholders? Well, I thank the member for his question. And there are two uh, fairly big consultations that are currently underway in my department, one around the sub-regional programme for soccer and another one into an overarching strategy for arts and culture for 10 years. So they have been very beneficial, not just talking about those particular subjects, but certainly people at those meetings who come from the community and voluntary sector, who represent a wide range of needs, have also used opportunities to raise other concerns. As I said to previous uh, questions and my answer, that process still has not been completed. It will be completed at the end of this month. And that my aim for that process is going to be consistent with the, the position that I have adopted my department. I'm going to protect people, particularly people who are vulnerable, as much as I possibly can. I call Andy Allen for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for her answer. Does the Minister anticipate any reduction or ending of school and community engagement programmes as a result of budget cuts? Well, certainly I'm not aware of any uh, programmes that the member has specifically. If he wants to you know, put those concerns in writing, I'll try and get them responded to. But I'll repeat again. My job is to try and protect people, particularly who have had difficulty in the past in accessing frontline services. Through DECAL and the Armstrong bodies, I will try and make those people a priority as best as I possibly can. I call Phil Flanagan. Can I ask the, the Minister for an update on uh, Libraries and I's proposals for the redevelopment of the library in Enniskin? Well, certainly the member will be aware that there, we're actually in the final stages of looking at the proposals for that. Uh, I hope to have that exercise completed, certainly, uh, if not by the end of this month, but certainly beginning of next month, and I will keep the member and other members informed. Call for Flanagan for supplementary. Gore Mugget, I'll ask you, Cure, the Minister may be aware uh, that in Cookstown, the uh, South West College campus is co-located with the site of uh, the library in that town, and that, that presents uh, obvious syn synergies for the local community and for the for the student population. Does the Minister accept that uh, such synergies could be generated in Enniskillen with the co-location of the Enniskillen Library on the site of the proposed um, South West College at the old Urn Hospital site in the town? Well, without coming down on a preferred site, and the member has been very detailed on what his preferred option is, I do accept the point that he's making primarily around making sure that there is best use when public services are being developed, that they are developed in parallel as much as possible, if not uh, that they're, actually, they're going to be neighbours. So we have that in mind. In fact, I think Libraries NI, as one of the ALBs in DECAL, have gone a long way, not only to try and work with users of their services, but also work with other departments and having libraries as a focus and indeed as a venue that people can access other services that they may have some difficulty or reluctance to elsewhere. So that as much public investment and the bigger return for ratepayers and taxpayers and people as much as we can do it, I'm open to looking at that, but I think it's uh, certainly not appropriate for me to comment on the specific proposals that the member mentioned earlier. Uh, I call Gordon Lyons to quickly ask the question. Thank you. Um, the Minister will be aware that the, last week was National Libraries Week and I had the pleasure of uh, visiting Whitehead Library. Uh, the Minister will know that libraries are more than just places now where you can go to borrow books. What action has her department taken to ensure uh, that people are aware of the different services that are provided and what other actions has her department taken in order to ensure the sustainability of local libraries? Well, certainly the member will be aware that in the past I have given uh, a bigger level of protection to libraries than, it, than other ALBs within my department uh, because I know that the services that are offered in libraries do have an overarching aspect. 
uh, they are about more than bar on books, but I think it's information and certainly generating some awareness is key. Uh, and I think libraries have been very, very good at doing that. And not only have they brought additional people in, which have became members, but they've actually brought people into services that didn't even know were there in the first place. Uh, and that is uh, time is up for questions to the minister, and we must move.